Turn to Genesis 1, as we ought. We we'll in verses 26 to 31. We'll go some other places as well. So, having one, you know, we, we could do a whole camp on this subject. Um, and I, I could have done every session on a different aspect of this. And, um, there you go. Uh, but, for the sake of time and the sake of wanting to cover more things, the goal this morning is to present you with what the Bible positively says about men, women, marriage, and the image of God. And then as we have time at the end to discuss how you use that to engage with, well, the kinds of ideologies that you saw dis on display in that video, which, while they were being humorous about it, absolutely exists, and I'm sure you know this already. So we need to find out, first, what we collectively are, what humanity is. And humans are the image of God. We see this in Genesis 1, 26, 31, which says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed shall be food for you. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So here's your $5 word of the day. The Imago Dei just means image of God. But now you can say it in a more impressive way if you would like. But that is what we are. It is not something that we have that, that moves around and, and is uh, malleable or, or changeable, but it is who we are. What it means to be human is to be an image bearer of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, I could survey all of the biblical texts that accumulate that uh, definition for us, but we would, again, need a lot more time. So I'm relying on a theologian, and if you pay attention to Pastor Lewis's sermons, you'll hear this guy quoted quite a bit, Herman Bovink. And he gives us a helpful definition that I think summarizes the biblical teaching very well. That what it means to be an image bearer is that we image God in the essence of our humanity, which is a union of soul and body, not a disconnect, not a body that is possessed by a soul in some kind of weird, like, animatronic way, and not a uh, mere body, a mere material thing, but there is an immaterial aspect to what it means to be human, a material one, and these things are joined together in some mysterious way that we know not what, but that's okay, because again, like I said yesterday, there are a lot of things that we just have to be okay with not knowing. Um, and, and, but what we do know is that that is the case, that there is, uh, those two things are brought together in our image bearing. Secondly, in the capacities and abilities of that essence, things like knowing, feeling, willing, and acting, that is part of what it means to be image of God. And finally, in the properties and gifts of that essence and their capabilities, Holiness, knowledge, and righteousness. Now, those last three uh, are created in Adam and Eve in the beginning. But what happens to those things after the fall? Well, they are marred. They are distorted, twisted, corrupted. And that results in a corruption of the rest. The knowing, feeling, willing, and acting, all of those things are 
fruit of this holiness, knowledge, and righteousness, and when we are become unholy, when we cease to know God in the way that we should, we know Him, that He exists, but we don't know Him in a peaceful, relational way. When we become unrighteous, then that affects our ability to know properly. Like we've been teaching this entire week, uh, to know something the way that you ought to know it is to relate that thing to its creator. That the atheist knows that the sky is blue, but he doesn't know why, which means he doesn't know that fact the way he should know it. We don't feel the way we should. We feel a kind of sorrow that is a, an ungodly kind of sorrowing. That's a category in scripture. There's a godly way to grieve and there's an ungodly way. We feel disconnected from our bodies sometimes in weird ways. Or we feel like, well, that you're the wrong gender. There's wrong ways that we begin to feel as a result of this fall. Willing and acting. We want the wrong things and we do the wrong things. And then even down to the body, which falls prey to disease, suffering, and sometimes even just malformed, even in the womb. So all of those things the, the fall does is it distorts, twists, and claws at this image of God and corrupts us in every aspect of our being, but it does not remove the image entirely. It can't, because that's what we are. We have to cease to exist to cease being image of God. Which means that though we distort that image and, and it is corrupted by our sin, it still holds its inherent dignity and value and worth. This is the reason given for why murder is wrong in Genesis 9, is that man is made in God's image. Therefore, it is wrong for us to assault him unjustly and to take his life. So we still maintain dignity and value, even if we fall to the uttermost depths of depravity and seek to discard the image of God from us. We can't escape it because that's who we are. And if that's the case, then that means that God gets to define us. God tells us who we are. We don't get to just decide who we are. We don't get to decide what we are. We don't get to make sweeping declarations of, well, we're just mere animals. And we also don't get to make sweeping declarations of, we're whatever letter of the alphabet acronym that you want to be that day. We don't get to just do that. God declares to us who we are. We must look to his word to figure out what that means. So then we get... In Genesis 1, we get that declaration of image bearing. Let's make man in our image. And then we get the follow up male and female. He created them in his image. So we then have two perspectives on the one image man and woman. Both created wholly and uniquely in God's image. So they bear equal dignity and value. And that means that men and women are all there is. There is no in-between. There is no third thing. That's it. Jesus reinforces this in Matthew 19, which we'll look at in a moment. We can see the differences emerge in the fall when each is cursed according to the unique roles, duties, and proclivities that differentiate them. So while man and woman are equally image-bearing, they reflect diff different aspects of image-bearing. In the way that they're made, they're made differently, and in the roles, duties, and inclinations that each have. If we look at the fall in Genesis 3, verse 16 and 19, we see this show up in the way that men and women are uniquely cursed by God because of their sin. For the woman... He says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. 
And so we see that she has a different kind of duty than the man, the bearing of children. And that this is then cursed by uh, God with, in, in, in judgment because of their sin to be a painful process. And then, one of her other duties that we uh, skipped over a little bit is that uh, in Genesis 2, God specifically creates Eve to help Adam with the task that he's been given, to be a, a, a helper suitable to, uh, to, to complete him, to allow him to do what he actually, he can't do what he's supposed to without her. And so he's given uh, a wife for this purpose. And yet here, there's a role reversal. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, this text can be misused and misunderstood, but what's happening here is that Eve's, when it says her desire will be for her husband, um, what is being said is that she will want to be him. She'll want what he has. Rather than wanting to help him, she will want to flip the switch here, flip uh, to have a role reversal. And then when it says he will rule over her, it doesn't mean that uh, he will have, he'll be like the Lord over her, but that he will be a tyrant. His response to her, his sinful response to her sinful action will often be tyranny. In, in a fallen world, this is, this is what happens. The, the feminist movement tries to take over society, and it results in more patriarchal tyranny, <laughs> ironically. Because what happened to the feminist movement, well, some of you may not study this, but it's been hijacked by a bunch of men who think they're women. And that is just this curse playing itself out. The feminists wanted to be like men, well, they got a bunch of men who want to be women ruling over them. Um, and so this curse has been playing out ever since the garden. And then for the man, he is cursed uniquely. God says to him, curse is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. So Adam is cursed. His work is cursed. His cultivation of the ground is cursed. This was his task. And so his labor is cursed. He is, but we see through this some of his duties. He was to lead. He was to cultivate the earth. He was to provide. And now that hurts in the same way that the woman's task of childbearing hurts. And then verse 19, by the sweat of your face, you will, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. And so he will feel not just physical pain, but existential pain. That all of his sweat and toil is going to feel futile because he is taken from dust and to dust he shall return. He's going to die one day. And all of the work that he's done is going to feel like it didn't matter. Now, can it matter? Yes. Christianity, part of what it does is it reverses these curses. That's what Jesus is doing. And so we are not doomed to suffer forever under these curses. Men and women can get along in marriage, in fact. <laughs> um, but it requires obedience to God. It requires new hearts. It requires Christ to save you in order for that to work out. You can have meaningful work. You can have, though, physical pain and childbearing, maybe not all the existential pain uh, that always would come along with it otherwise if you were left to your own devices in that regard. So, we see here some of the unique roles and duties given to women and so some of the things that differentiate them. So, they're different in the way that they're made, not just biologically, but across the whole scheme of the image. So when you see that definition of image, you can read into it, it that the, it, we bear the image uniquely as men and women and then fill in the rest of the blank in the essence of our humanity, soul and body. 
and so on and so forth. So for men, you, we have duties like leadership, fatherhood, provision, warfare. This gives men different inclinations. It means they are built differently. It doesn't mean that women can't engage, well, they can't be fathers, but it doesn't mean that they, are, they, they never do any kind of leading. It doesn't mean they never do any kind of provisioning. We see that in Proverbs 31, a woman engaging in income gathering. It doesn't mean that they are never forced because of circumstances to engage in violence. We see that with jail and judges. She drives a tent peg into Sisera's head and ends a war in Israel. But again, it's about what are they made for? What are we created for to do primarily and chiefly? What are our duties before God? When a man acts according to these duties and inclinations in a godly way, he is being masculine. Men have it easy in many ways in this regard. Jesus is not just our example in every way as Christians, but specifically in how to be manly. Jesus wept, and he raised up his voice and shouted when the circumstances required it. Jesus spoke kindly to a hurting woman, hurting women, multiple cases, but he also cleared the temple with a whip. And so there's two different extremes, even within Christian circles, about this, especially targeting men. One wants men to just be puddles of tears all the time, and the other wants them to, well, crying is weakness. Being any kind, showing any kind of emotion is weakness. You need to be super buff and macho all the time. We see a better way with Jesus that both of these things are true of masculinity. And then when balanced together, create the perfect man. In the case of Jesus, of course, he is that. For women, you have duties like nurturing children, helping her husband bear the weight of his duties, creating beauty and being beautiful. This means that you're built differently. When a woman acts according to these duties and inclinations in a godly way, she is being feminine. Her chief examples in scripture is the church in glory and the feminine personification of wisdom in Proverbs. Great biblical book, recommend reading it. Women are not meant to be merely dainty or reclusive. The Proverbs 31 woman creates beautiful things, learns and grows wise in wisdom, teaches others her ways, is shrewd in barter and trade for her household. She does all of these things. She has a lot of responsibilities that she carries out. And so though we are created differently and given different responsibilities and duties, we need to have a balanced biblical view of these things. And I don't have time to go through all of the possible examples here, but there's just a few. Now marriage, what is that? Well, we get definitions in multiple places. Chiefly, we have Genesis chapter 2, since you're already in the area. Let's flip there, 2.18 to 24. says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, your Bible, depending on which translation you have, you may notice that verse 23 looks a little different. It's indented differently, or it, it um, you know, in mine... It has two columns instead of one because mine's a weird setting. But you may notice that, that it, it, it stops being prose for a second and switches into poetry. That's what that means. When you're reading your Bible and you see that happen in the middle, like you've just got walls of text, and then suddenly the, it looks offset and there are short lines, that's telling you that you've entered a different genre at that point. And so many look at this verse in verse 23 and that this is a song of some kind. 
that Adam sees his wife and he breaks out into joyous song that, look, this, this woman that God has given me is a gift to me and I should cherish her. And so verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And so we have these two perspectives on the one image in man and woman united together in marriage to display the fullness of God's image in the world together. But ultimately, marriage is a picture of the gospel. Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 32. Let's flip there. So in this section of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is going into one of his famous household codes. These happen a lot in the uh, epistles in the New Testament, the letters to the churches, where there will be specific instructions given to different people in the church, different kinds of people, to wives, husbands, children, etc. And so that's what he's beginning to do here. In verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means that men, when you're heading into marriage, This is the object. This is the goal. You are to emulate Christ in the way that you love your wife, being willing to give your life for her, and not just in a physical sense, but to deny your own wants, cares, desires, things that are not inherently good, but maybe just things that you would like and prefer, to be able to give those up for her, to love her in that way. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. And then he quotes, Genesis 2, this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So marriage exists to display the gospel. It's not ultimately just for you or your spouse. Though you receive glorious gifts in marriage, being with one another. But those are all secondary to the purpose of marriage, which is to set forth the gospel to the world in a metaphor that is used here in Scripture and elsewhere across all of the Bible, that God is in a covenant relationship with his people, just as a man and woman enter into a covenant of marriage. And this is why all of the tragedies that relate to men, women, and marriage, all of the sin that is directed at those aspects of who we are. This is why they are so egregious and why God hates them. Because they defile the picture of the gospel that he has set into the world. They corrupt it. They tell a different story than the one that God intended to tell with man and woman in marriage. It was to display his relationship to his people, his sacrificial love for his people. That was the purpose. And so, in our maleness and femaleness, both in body and soul, things are not well with us, as we see, as I know you all know very well. Even when I was your age, it was starting to happen in a very public and open way. People began to, but first for, in in my day, it was just homosexuality. That was where it stopped. It was just 
people wanting to uh, change who they wanted to marry. For you all, it's not even about that anymore because I think what has happened is they've learned that that's not enough. It's not enough. They're trying, the, the way to get at God is through assaulting his image. You can't see God. You can't attack him directly. And then whenever he does show up, they kill him, Jesus. And so now that they can't get at Jesus directly, they have to go after his people. So the church experiences persecution and the image of God in the world in every aspect. So it's not just an assault on marriage anymore. Well, they won that battle, so to speak. But now it's the, the very image bearing that we carry in ourselves. And we'll see this both uh, in the next lesson and the one after. That all of these c- competing and conflicting worldviews that come up against Christianity, their goal is to attack God through attacking the image. It's always the goal. So if you have a positive biblical position on the image, you will be completely immune to this. You'll be chilling. They can't get under your skin. Because you know what they're trying to do. You know that they can't be right. (laughs) That what's wrong with them is sin. You know, the video, the old Babylon Bee skit that you watch is funny. But the alien is wrong at the end. It's not just full of mentally ill people. It's full of sinners who hate God. The world is full of it. Has always been since the fall. And they are trying to claw at the image in them and rid themselves of it. And they can't do it no matter how hard they try. They can mutilate their bodies. They can tell themselves a different story. But they cannot escape being image of God. And that is your point of contact with them and you must make contact. We cannot run from the fight because the fight is here. You're in it. And so, if you are approached by someone who thinks that they are not the gender that God created them as, they believe that their body should be mutilated to try to fix it. They believe all kinds of horrific things about you. They think that you're a bigot, a murderer, I've been, called a, I've been called a murderer for believing everything I just taught you. Because they consider me responsible for whenever someone who is, uh, who believes in all the gender stuff kills themselves. Well, you're responsible for that. They will try to lay the deaths of others at your feet. And the question that you will have to answer for yourself will be, do I fear God or do I fear man? Remember, one of the things that we've been emphasizing over the last few days has been that humans are dust. We are, as I like to say in my other class, uh, chicken nuggets compared to God. That's what we are. And that's not just what you are. That's who they are. What's the worst that can happen? For the Christian, the worst thing that happens is they kill you. Okay, great. Now I'm with Jesus. This is why Christianity can't be stopped. Because the worst thing that can happen to us is that they send us to be with our Lord. Okay, we have the hope of the resurrection. You can't stop Christianity. But the worst thing that can happen to you is probably not going to happen to you. At least not here. So, when you look at... a chapter like Matthew 6, like we looked at yesterday, and Jesus tells you not to be anxious about your life in terms of your material well-being, we can make an application there to our hesitancy often to confront these issues with people that we know, people who are buying into those lies. But if you truly love them and care about them, and you should, because they bear God's image, then the only way for them to escape that is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has freedom for them from these ideologies. Which means that you have to open your mouth and speak. And that's hard. And it can be scary. But remember whose you are and who you are in Christ. 
You haven't lost your mind. You believe that you are image of God. And if you trust in Christ, then he is restoring the image that you had so often marred and clawed at with your sin. As the gospel restores us to our unique purpose as men and women image bearers. That which is sinful and wrong with us is not immutable. It is not unchangeable. That is the great lie that is being spread. Well, I was born this way. Well, my environment inculcated this into me. Well, my mental illness makes it where I just can't stop. No. God is creating new people. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. If our desires are disordered and we long for that which we ought not to, God can change us. There is even hope for our broken bodies in the resurrection. All that is wrong with us, if we are in Christ, will one day be set right. That is the hope that we have in us, that we must give it defense for when asked. 